Ladies and gentlemen, luck uh, from IBM. Yes, hello everyone. Um, my name is Luke. Um, I'm originally from Holland, but live, live and work in, uh, in Norway. And I've been asked to tell you a little bit about what we feel about uh, responsible AI. Uh, judging on the, the former speaker, I think we are very much in agreement that AI is fantastic, but you need to do it properly. So hopefully I can show you that uh, at least in, in our company we are trying to do that as much as possible. So I'll, I'll start with the video just uh, starting on the high note first. Problems. It's human nature to hate problems. But why is that? After all, problems inspire us to mend things, bend things, make things better, to rewrite the rule books, the history books, and future books. Floor change to tile. That's why so many people work with IBM on everything from city traffic to ocean plastic, from new schools to new energy, from flight delays to food safety. You're gonna help daddy make a salad? You want yeah. Problems even got us to the moon and back on one tank of gas. And who knows where they'll take us next. <clears throat> now that shows a lot of possibilities that this technology has and why do we have that possibility it's because we are producing more and more data uh, we are all most probably on social media uh, maybe even more than one um, we have internet of things producing more and more data and this is the slide that I created two and a half years ago so the numbers are old the numbers are much higher now um, but at least it shows that we are producing more and more data and one of the problems is that that data, the more we produce, is unstructured type of data. Now, so what we're doing is basically <coughs> we're digitizing our society. And this is a word that uh, especially politicians in Norway love to use. I hate that word because this is only uh, causing us problems because we're creating more and more data which we're basically not able to consume and understand what's underlying in the data with at least our traditional systems, our traditional way of handling that type of unstructured data. So we're, relatively speaking, becoming dumber and dumber instead of more intelligent. Uh, we're creating what we call a performance gap in basically understanding what the data means and especially with Internet of Things where that type of data that's being produced by sensors is time critical. If you don't use any, uh, or understand what's happening within the first two, three seconds after the data was produced by the sensor, then probably it's already too late because something has happened that you can't do uh, things to anymore. So we need to work in a different way. We need to actually not just digitize or electrify our uh, analog objects, but we actually need to use that data to transform the way we take our decisions, uh, which is digital transformation. Now, oh, interestingly enough, there's no standard definition in our uh, line of business in the IT industry on what we call digital transformation, but I like this one. It's very simple, transforming decision-making with technology. Uh, leaving in, in the middle what type of technology we're actually using. Doing that, we actually can increase our knowledge and our capabilities. And we've seen uh, some uh, great examples also from uh, Simplify uh, earlier. Um, so, how, how can we do this in a proper way? Now, there has been a lot of talk by uh, people that have much more brain than I do, um, Elon Musk, uh, Stephen Hawking, on 
the fact that AI will be the doom of mankind. And the interesting thing is that Elon Musk, to counter that, is actually working on stuff that I find very <coughs> scary, um, creating neural lace interface between the brain directly with the internet, uh, basically stating that that's what we need as humans to compete with AI as soon as it gets um, general uh, AI. Now, this is a prediction, 2050, where they say that we will have an AI that is actually self-conscious and is able to create a unique new thoughts. As you can see, uh, we're not, uh, not there yet at all. A lot of people say that the technology that we have, the algorithms, the, the neural networks that we have today, are actually not capable of reaching this. So actually, if we want to get a general AI, we need to think of new things, which we don't know what are yet. We are actually within moving out of narrow AI, so very tight use cases, and broadening out the use of AI more and more. Some say 2050, some say 2000, uh, or 20,500, nobody knows if we ever reach general AI. So I just want to uh, remind you that we are uh, far away from reaching that place, but we're moving more and more in broad AI, which is a disruptive and pervasive way of using AI. That means that we're using AI everywhere. And it was stated already before, uh, I think we in IBM, we calculate that we have around 2 billion users of our Watson technology at the moment. Nobody knows that they're using it because it's embedded in all kinds of solutions that you're not seeing, but there's algorithms used. And everybody here in the room has a smartphone. I would guess 30 to 40% of those apps that you're using use AI in some way or other. Or I should say machine learning. Because AI, I think it's a, it's a loaded term. But anyway, the, the point is, we're using this type of technology, these type of algorithms all over the place, and we as a user are not very conscious about that. Um, let me show you some examples. This is a project that we've done together with Daimler. And everybody, uh, I had that several times with bad cars. Uh, you drive in the middle of the, the forest in, in Norway, and all of a sudden you get a pop-up on your dashboard with some sort of icon that you've never seen before. And you stop the car and you say, what happened now? So you reach into the glove compartment, take out the 500 pages Bible paper book, and try to find the icon to understand what has happened to your car, <coughs> can you drive, or do you stop, you call um, help, um, and obviously you never find that icon because it's hidden somewhere on, on a page in the middle. So Daimler understood that and they created the solution together with us where we combine augmented reality and AI together. So what they did was actually create a, an application that you can talk to, at first was in German, but it's, it's uh, available in 11 languages now. Uh, and you can point the camera in, in the phone in, on parts of the car, and it understands what you're pointing at, and then you can ask it a question. And obviously then, the solution answers in context. So you can do this all over the car, and zoom in. Zoom in and, and go more and more detail within the different systems. Now, what's interesting with this example is that Daimler owns all the data. It's more or less a closed system. Daimler has trained the system. They know everything about the car. Daimler knows the right answers. So they have full control over what the algorithms are doing. Keep that in mind. 
Now, IBM has been very <coughs> aggressively mo moving into the healthcare system, healthcare services, and using AI in different settings. Obviously, when we do that, you need to do this in, a, in an ethical and a good way, because in the Daimler case, the worst thing that can happen is that you ruin your car, cost money. Worst case in healthcare system is that you actually kill patients. And obviously there's a big difference in how to handle that. But there's a number of drivers why we need to use AI in the healthcare system. One is technology itself, obviously, because there's a lot of uh, digitization going on also in the healthcare system. Most uh, med medical uh, technology is now digitized and creating information or data in a digital form. And it, uh, in the healthcare system in Norway today, for example, you take an EKG. That EKG is then printed out of paper, scanned in, and then added as a <coughs> PDF to your patient journal at the moment. That's how we're using technology. So. We need to, to use that technology in a different way. There's another issue, which is more a business issue. This is uh, statistics, it's not from, from us, it's from the health, health directorate. Basically stating how much time each doctor has for each patient. This is a gen general uh, uh, exam that they've done between 1994 and 2014. Now, if you then realize that in cancer, the, the cancer area alone, there's around 500 research papers produced every week. Each, five, each research paper is consisting of about 300 to 500 pages of text, images, conclusions. Obviously, if, if you have a family relative that gets a cancer diagnosis, God forbid, you would like that doctor that treats your family member to have read all the recent research, have read the whole patient journal, and understands the diagnosis completely on the latest, latest and greatest news. Obviously, when you look at the statistics, that's, that's it situation that cannot be handled by doctors alone. So, there's a balancing act. We would like to do innovation in the healthcare sector, but you need to do this in a proper way, uh, without um, basically endangering patients. You need to think about patient safety at the same time that you want to do innovation. Because we have a, and this is not just for Norway, this is all over the world, the healthcare system that is not sustainable if we keep on doing it the way we do. So there has to be a balance between good bias. Good bias in this case is actually the algorithm understanding the medical literature, understanding the diagnosis, understanding the biology, understanding genetics, etc. etc. Because you, you want to make sure that that algorithm is highly skilled and knowledgeable. At the same time, do away with bad bias. Bad bias is meaning all the other stuff, obviously. And it needs to be representative. <coughs> Algorithms in general needs to be representative for the population that you want to make the predictions for, because it's usually used for predictions. So then we come into the area of bias. If you think about it, when, started, when do we, did we start to talk about bias in, in literature in general or in, in, uh, in the media? Anyone? I've, I've, I've looked it up, it was in 2015. That's when bias started trending as a word. You started looking up bias in Google, people started talking about bias all over the place. Was that the year when bias started? Bias, bias is with us because it's, it's human. Bias is created because of the business model 
how we create knowledge. Researchers are paid for their research. Can we then rely on the objectivity of that research? Somebody says yes, if it's a proper researcher. Others say no. It very much depends. The other thing is, why started, did we start to write and talk about bias in 2015? Because we started using these types of technologies. And that's why I'm using this, this picture as a, a mirror. Basically, these technologies that we're using are holding a mirror up against us and saying you're biased. You have to figure this out because this is going wrong. So when we look at a classroom, I have uh, two children that are, at, at the moment they are studying. Um, when they are in the classroom, I hope that the teachers they have actually understand, have good bias, they understand, they are professional, they understand what they're trying to teach my children. But at the same time, that they're not biased in the wrong way. Because I want them to have an objective stance on all kinds of things in the world. Same thing goes for algorithms. You need to train them in such a way that they are not um, created biased. Either because they are using the wrong data, i.e. the knowledge that are being used by, by the teacher, or because they are basically uh, given the wrong information, <coughs> willingly. And this can happen. And a partner slash competitor of ours found that out the hard way. This is a chatbot that was established on a number of social media. It was a very interesting experiment for the whole industry, not just for Microsoft. They created an algorithm that basically was self-taught. It was taught a number of co concepts from language in the beginning. But well, then it was basically programmed to say, okay, everything that comes into your chatbot, you need to replicate back in, in different words. And then there were some people that understood that and started bombarding it with uh, very right-wing sentiments. So within 24 hours, it went from saying humans are super cool to really coming with very nasty uh, comments uh, in general. So Microsoft took it down and it was a lesson to the whole whole industry saying that you need to have control over the data. As I said with the Daimler example, it's a closed system. This was meant to be totally open and see how that would, would go. And that's what happened. Another one. This is not a drawdown on, uh, on facial recognition, but there's nothing wrong with facial recognition, but it's when you do facial recognition in order to classify people, put them into a group of some sort. And they did an experiment on the members of the House, House of uh, Representatives in the US, and it turned out that this uh, specific algorithm for facial recognition was not taught properly to recognize darker faces. So 25 of those House of Representatives were basically classified as crooks, as criminals. And obviously it, it, it created a large uproar, uproar in, in the United States when that came out. And actually these types of classification algorithms are being used by law enforcement in the US. So this is a big uh, sign or uh, alert to us in the industry that we need to do this in a proper way. We can't just be technology optimists, which I am, but we, knew, we need to understand that there's downsides to using this technology as well, but we need to be on guard. Now this is, I laughed when I saw that headline, uh, the Pentagon looking for an ethicist, uh, basically trying to, to define that we can do war in an ethical way. 
I, I thought this was mind blowing from my, my perspective. But anyway, there's more and more talk about killer drones, autonomous drones, basically creating decisions themselves, using facial recognition, for example, and being able to not only uh, recognize but actually take action on that with weapons, which is totally, totally unacceptable. So we, from an IBM perspective, we have, we have worked on this for a very long time. We actually have had an ethics board in our uh, development of AI since 2013. And we had people interested in the topic a long way back. This is uh, a statement which I, I found very, very relevant and right, because we need to think about the ethics of AI, both in the uses usage of it, but also the development of it and the deployment of it. You shouldn't start thinking about ethics at the end when you start using it. You need to do this the whole process. And actually she is the only IT vendor uh, representation in the EU ethics board in, in Europe at the moment. So when we talk about trust in AI, because Frankly, and I have been in a, in a discussion online around GDPR. Uh, it was stated by someone that um, GDPR is hampering the AI development in Europe. We should look at, at the US and especially China because there they can use all kinds of data without asking any questions and train their algorithms. So the thesis was that we should do away with GDPR and go ahead with it, because otherwise we will be behind in Europe in the AI development. And I was totally against that, because we from IBM say that if we, as a community, don't trust the algorithms that are used on us, then the AI will not be successful. And we believe that the only AI that will be standing, left standing, in five years' time is the AI that you and I trust. The way we trust when we go into an airplane, nobody thinks about that 98% of the time the airplane is flown by a machine, not by a person. Why? Because we have empirical proof that it's okay, because planes usually stay up in the air, even in bad weather conditions. So we have a number of principles when we use, that we use when we uh, build AI. It has to be accessible, i.e. you need to understand how it came to a conclusion. Black box, yes, maybe, but then you have to, some, have to build something on top that can understand what the black box actually is doing. Again, somebody says we need to open up the black box. I think that would stop AI development in its tracks because AI development is commercial. Obviously, when a company creates an algorithm which is competitive advantage for them, they will not share that with the rest of the world because then they will lose their competitive advantage. If that's the case, then they will never build algorithms like that and we will not, never get the benefits of AI. So we need to counter the black box. It has to be fundamentally sound, obviously. Uh, it needs to create the right decisions. It needs to be inclusive, contain data of the whole group that you want to predict things for, and reversible is the interesting one. If you answer to the question, would I like that algorithm to be used on my, myself, for me, and the question is, mm, or no, then you shouldn't use it. You should do away with it and do something else. And this comes right from the top. It's pragmatic, but it's also wise to actually do ethical development of AI. Both technology-wise, but also the reason why you do this. We need to have guiding principles. And we use them internally. One of the things is, we, when we start a project, with a partner, and that's what our customers are now, because they deliver the data and the expertise on the business model. We come with the technology and the expertise on the technology. 
So it's to augment human intelligence and we define upfront what the data is going to be used for. In addition, the data that we use to train the algorithm is owned by the company that we work with. So if we do a find solution for one customer, we can't take the learn model and use it on another customer. Again, it's this competitive advantage. You can't do that. So both the data and the insights, the algorithms, the training, is owned by the company that we work with, or the organization. So there needs to be transparency. We need to have confidence in the conclusions, the decisions these algorithms take. And we need to help create more skills because there's a lack of skills. And because we have lack of skills, we create bad solutions, which is a problem. Well, to come back to the data itself, in all the projects that I've been involved in and the projects that my colleagues in, uh, in Norway and around the world are, are involved in, we see the same problem time and again. Getting control and access to the data that you need to train the algorithms. So that's why we have, based on our experience, created this model. It's a, it's a ladder. <coughs> how we stepwise get control over the data, both internally and externally, that is used to, to train the, the algorithms. Um, this is very important, because if you lose control of your data, uh, then you create biased solutions. We understand that um, black boxes will remain. That's why we we create an algorithm that actually is able to, to check those black boxes, to check the algorithms, which is called the open scale. And this is a solution that is on our, our cloud. But at the same time, we understand this is just the first shot. As, as was said by a previous speaker from PwC, um, fairness, transparency, those are things that are very difficult. They are all, almost conundrums which are maybe even unsolvable. Um, that's why we invite everybody to work with us on these algorithms. We have actually created three open source projects. Uh, one is um, uh, transparency, the other is fairness, and the, the third one is safety. Judging from Pi, the chatbot, we need to understand when a, an algorithm is being attacked. Either the data is being skewed or something else, which basically hampers with the fairness of the model itself. So I like this statement very much. AI will be the best or worst thing ever for humanity, so let's get it right. Um, I think we are in a very good position, historically, using this mirror that started in 2015 to actually improve the way we make decisions, to improve the way we create knowledge as, as humankind, as a species, to become much more objective rather than subjective, and be much more fair with each other using these types of technology. But well, obviously we need to do it right. We need to do it right. So in closing, I just want to show uh, <clears throat> I hope, I suspect that everybody knows about uh, what's in jeopardy in 2011, which was basically a combination of a eight, nine year research project that IBM Research did to see if we could create a system that could uh, converse with a, a human on human premise. <coughs> they got a new mission in 2012. And I'll show a video on what that was. real world problems, a lot of times they don't have a clear bottom line win, otherwise we wouldn't debate things. According to rules set by the candidates themselves. What we are trying to accomplish here is really to demonstrate that we can have a meaningful and valuable discussion between man and machine. We are actually trying to show that a computer system can add, if you want a conversation or decision making, by bringing facts and doing a different kind of argumentation.
Hello, Dan. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. The debate system tries to understand the concept over which we are debating. Having analyzed the data, I will argue that we should subsidize music education. When it gets the topic, until you hear the first speech, it's collecting all the possible arguments, trying to remove redundancy. It is about recognizing important issues for society. The system is evolving. The IBM Debater can have all the opinions in the world, but IBM Debater does not pay taxes, and we do. You are speaking at the extremely fast rate of 218 words per minute. There is no need to hurry. The value of the technology is really to allow decision makers to take more informed decisions. There is a territory which is uncharted to some extent, and this is where we are now. Thank you for listening.